Senator Ryan Weld joins us now out of the Northern Panhandle. Senator Weld, good morning. Appreciate you joining us today. Good morning, all. Great to have you with us, sir. Also a candidate for attorney general as well. Uh, the uh, main topic of conversation today, though, is uh, to focus on Senator Weld's military background and get into a discussion right now of Hamas and Israel and the chaos that's uh, taking place right now in the world there. And uh, if you could, sir, once again, recap your military background for us. Sure. Uh, first, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I spent a number of of years on active duty. I was an intel guy in the, in the Air Force, spent the majority of my career uh, assigned to one of the agencies in D.C., part of the intel community, but then also spent time in Germany uh, as an intel analyst and wrapped up with the deployment in Afghanistan uh, as the intel officer to we had a, a small joint Army Air Force team there. And it is that intel background which we want to talk about today because that is the big question right now. Where was the Israeli intelligence while this was uh, being planned, and then this uh, surprise attack was then implemented? Uh, that is the question that is on everybody's mind who pays attention to, to this issue. I mean, this is the most catastrophic failure of Israeli intelligence since the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Uh, I, there were just there had to have been, for people who, who are interested in this kind of thing, a, a number of threat indicators that would have been out there to give some sort of notice or forewarning of an attack that was this complex, that was carried out uh, by air, by land, by sea, uh, that involved over 2,000 rockets. Uh, the, the fact that that buildup and the planning was not caught beforehand, that none of those warning signs were, were, were seen earlier and, and gave rise to, to, to cause them to, to prepare for something like this is just unbelievable. Um, you know, the Israelis have always been kind of envied because of their intel sources, whether you know, they have a, a lot of uh, human assets uh, on the ground in Gaza and in the West Bank that have allowed them to infiltrate into to Hamas and get a better insight into their tactics. Uh, you know, signals intelligence like radio traffic, text, phone calls, none of that uh, picked up on this. And so, you know, there will be a reckoning in the Israeli government and their intel community and their military when this is all said and done. Uh, back in 1973, it, it took a couple of years for, for Golda Meir's government to fall following the, the surprise attacks by Egypt and Syria. Um, but eventually it, her government did fall, and, and I would suspect that they're going to have the same type of reckoning after this that they did, you know, back 50 years ago. Retired uh, Navy veteran Admiral Bill Stubblefield next. Uh, good morning, Ryan. Good to talk with you again. Morning, sir. Uh, this can be characterized, as some have characterized it, uh, scales different, obviously, to that of Pearl Harbor. Uh, we were caught com uh, completely by surprise, also 9-11. So these instances happen. Uh, and today, and in the U.S.'s case, there was some fault given to previous administrations that we had de-emphasized uh, human input. We were resorting too much to remote uh, technology. Uh, does that apply in this case as well? Do you have any ideas, Senator? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I know from experience when I was deployed and, and, and we had sources on the ground in, in Zabal, Afghanistan, that if we just had single-source human, if we were only getting a report of, of, of something through one person, then it, we always had to collaborate that. Yet you always had to get a backup on something like that. And so human intelligence is sometimes the most difficult to, to collaborate but it's also sometimes the, the freshest thing that you're going to have to, to real-time information that someone may have gained firsthand. And so sometimes you have to discount it, but sometimes it's all you have. And so I think there's going to be a lot of reporting that comes out of this that we're going to be able to get a better look on the inside and what they knew and when and what they didn't know. You know, a big problem that we had pre-9-11 was that we were compartmentalizing information too much that one branch or one service knew this piece of the puzzle and another branch or service or agency knew another piece of the puzzle, but they weren't sharing all the pieces of the puzzle with everyone to be able to put a, a clearer picture together. But that is that supposedly was corrected. 
it, it, in within the U.S. intelligence community, it, I mean, there were there was a lot of work that went into to making it much more of a, a, a horizontal uh, structure instead of a, a vertical structure where information wasn't shared. So on our side, we've done a better job. But the U.S. intelligence community, I mean, missed this as well. And 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 I think I feel that there's going to be a, a, an investigation and a commission put together probably on our side as well because. You know, we have a pretty good info sharing relationship with the Israelis when it comes to intel. And so we're going to have to take a look and see how we missed this as well. Did you ever work personally with the Israeli intelligence uh, service? I, I did not. I, I did some analysis. Uh, one of my assignments uh, was in that region, and I worked it pretty good for a, a period of time. But I didn't have any personal relationships uh, with Israeli individuals. Ryan, this is John Gilstrap. The Wall Street Journal has been doing some really outstanding reporting on all of this. They're the ones that broke the story that Iran has been deeply involved with the planning of, of this raid for weeks. It's also reporting now that the Israelis, it's, I'm reading the headline, Israelis shift tack on Hamas. Their intent is to crush instead of contain. And apparently they're uh, they're preparing for a ground war. The uh, artillery and air campaign against Gaza has has been crushing. Um, what are the chances, given the millions of people live in a pretty small area there in high rise, high rise buildings, and they've got the, the network of tunnels to get away and such? Um, how long will this would a battle like that take or a war like this take and how much danger is there since iran we know is involved i think syria launched, um, launched a couple of missiles in today in lebanon, in, in lebanon. It, can this it, are we looking at this escalating into something really big I, I i i don't think it will spread into a regional conflict i mean look this is my theory as i i sit here in, in brook county and and read all the reporting that I can open source. I, I, I think that there is the potential for the northern part of Israel to see an uptick in violence given Iran's longstanding support of Hezbollah and the Golan Heights in that area. In the southern part, how long this goes is anyone's guess because urban warfare, I mean, block to block, street to street fighting in a densely populated urban area like that is essentially the worst type of warfare and how long that gets drawn out is anyone's guess because if they're which i think they've made it clear as you stated is to crush hamas then that is a a full-scale invasion of of gaza and a full-scale occupation after they feel that they have completed their operations and cleaned the areas they want to clean i think that iran was involved in this for a couple of reasons, and I, because people have said, you know, why do this? Why launch? You, you're not going to overthrow the government of Israel. You're not going to occupy the entire country. You're not going to defeat their military. But Iran probably had a very, a larger goal in wanting to do this, and that is, you know, over the past months, year or so, the U.S. has been working to normalize diplomatic relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is. Iran's largest rival in the region. Uh, it's a Sunni-Shia argument that goes back thousands of years. And Iran sees them as the biggest threat to wanting to be the, the dominant power in the region. And so by launching this attack and, and giving Hamas aid to do so, does that A, scuttle that entire diplomatic dance that's been going on that comes with a security agreement between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, and B, if that were to take place, if that agreement were to happen, does that move the Palestinian issue kind of to the back burner? Because that's always been at the forefront of the kind of the, the crux of the argument between Israel and, and other Arab nations. And so did Hamas do this in part to also ensure that the Palestinian question doesn't get put on the back burner and put in the back of people's minds? Yeah. Uh, Ron, a couple of questions. Uh, one, I, I doubt if you'll be able to answer, but my sense is that atrocities happen all the time with terrorist activities. But this particular one, it appears more raw, more uh, more uh, uh, emotionally attached. Uh, 
one, why do you think that's the case, and do you think that will be the 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 result or the impetus for more aggressive action against Hamas? Oh, I I, I think absolutely it will only resolve and strengthen or strengthen the resolve that the Israelis have in, in this that the atrocities that they've that the, the, the world has seen essentially because of social media of women and children and elderly people being carted off and taken as captives or being killed and not just killed but killed in a very barbaric way that indicates that they were tortured uh, either before they were killed or that's how they were killed and then and then and, post, and, so, and then posting on someone's facebook yep yeah i mean i i, I read a, a thread this morning that uh, one member of hamas the live stream for 30 minutes on Facebook as they crossed into Israel and then what they did and what they saw once they were in Israel. And it, it included murdering an individual uh, and then throwing another, uh, the body of a dead Israeli in the back of a pickup truck and parading around with it. And, and that's very graphic and gruesome. And I think that gets into a whole larger question of what is social media's role in all of this and preventing this type of uh, you know, gruesome uh, warfare images, uh, going out but getting back to the original point i mean i think that yeah i think that not only did that strengthen israel's resolve but it also really i think kind of did away with the lie that has been perpetrated of a moral equivalency in all this well except well except the moral equivalency is continued to be projected certainly in most media outlets where they talk about total deaths Instead of Israeli deaths, they talk. I think it's two thousand between, you know, both on the the Israeli side as well as on the uh, Hamas side. So this this moral equivalency narrative, amazingly to me, continues to exist. And what do you think? A concern I have is that pretty soon, if not today, um, the the Hamas is going to be putting out these these images on social media of dead Palestinian children and by great numbers because Israeli the Israel is coming at them in a huge way. How long does the world stay on Israel's side on on this before it turns yet again and sort of forces Israel into this sort of false pacifist mindset? So that's an excellent question. Um, you know, back in 2021, Israel and Hamas went at it uh, pretty good. And Israel was pressured by the U.S. and other allies to, to stand down and to cease operations um, because there was, you know, uh, several uh, civilian deaths on the Palestinian side. And perhaps then they weren't finished and they need to go further. And, I mean, there's going to be a lot of discussion on that in the next couple of days, weeks, months. But to your question uh, on Palestinian deaths, look, the death of a civilian in warfare is always a, a tragedy. But there is a difference between intentionally targeting civilians and terrorizing civilians and murdering them in, in barbaric ways and a civilian you know, dying incidentally in warfare uh, because they were in the same building or in a building next door. But also we've seen Hamas use civilians as, as human shields by launching rockets and mortars off of school buildings, apartment buildings, or operating out of apartment buildings and, and using the people that live there as fodder, essentially, because they know what's going to happen in that building shortly thereafter. Yeah, we're talking about a building, but we also can talk about the whole area, the uh, the Gaza region. Uh, Egypt has closed off the exit point. Uh, Egypt's closed off the exit point with the with the intent of keeping the Hamas fighters uh, in place. Uh, but Hamas, I suspect, have ways of getting their fighters out, but the civilians have no way of getting out. Correct. There will be tunnels and, and rat lines. For the fighters to, to, to get across the border, uh, whether to seek medical attention or to be resupplied or bring material over, uh, it just is the same as, and there's there will be, uh, with the Arab terms, backsheesh for bribes to be paid uh, to get across that border as well. But you are correct that the civilians won't be able to leave. And, and so I know that uh, there are some, some diplomatic channels being used right now to try to open up 
a, a humanitarian corridor um, either into Egypt or over to the West Bank, which is not controlled by Hamas, but the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but it's, that is going to be the, the question, I think, in all of this as we look ahead is what will the patience be of the U.S., uh, uh, our European allies, over the next couple of, uh, of days, weeks, as the operation grinds in in Gaza. Well, we what know there's a feeling this look like. We know there's a humanitarian crisis coming because they have been completely cut off. They're, they don't have power. They don't have water. They don't have food. They don't have, you know, so <clears throat> that that in itself, at the same time, while being bombarded, we know that there's going to be a, a humanitarian crisis. And yesterday I heard a quote, I, I hope I don't slaughter, it comes from Golda Meir, I, I believe, who said, we can, um, we can forgive you for killing our babies. We can never forgive you for forcing us to kill yours. Yeah. And, you know, th- this is... This is a situation. It just seems to me, and I'm I'm not a politician and and don't don't want to be. But there comes a point you have to crush your enemy. Yeah, you know, this is Hamas wants nothing short of the elimination of Israel. And when when that's the goal of of the bad guys, then the good guys have to rise to to that level, don't they? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, let me they shift. Absolutely do. Let me shift gears a little bit, uh, Ryan. Uh, we only have four minutes left, yeah, so don't no, make it too complex. Yeah. Uh, Senator uh, Tuberville has put a freeze on all promotions. Uh, will that impact our response, our readiness for situations such as what we're seeing in Israel? I, I think there's a, a definitely a, a legitimate concern there. Uh, I don't know the rules of the Senate that well, um, if they can be confirmed one by one and how long that takes or if it always has to be in a block i don't know the specific positions that are waiting you know what are those or or a lot of those positions and we'll say centcom which has uh you know that's the the combat command that has the responsibility for this region that we're talking about i do know that we also we, we currently don't have an ambassador to israel uh, I don't know what the posture is on that, the status of that confirmation. Uh, and, and so I, I think that it's always important for us to be at full speed for our military and our diplomatic corps, uh, particularly in times like this when it's not just Israel and Palestine or, or the Gaza Strip, I mean, or if it's Russia and Ukraine, because we also have China looming over every conflict that is currently going on in the world and trying to, you know, frustrate our goals everywhere we turn. And so we just need to do what we can to ensure that that we are running at full speed in our intelligence communities and our military and diplomatic uh, communities as well and find a way to get that done. Senator Ryan Weld has been our guest here on the program. Senator Weld, uh, your thoughts on how this affects the Ukraine situation? Uh, So... You know, I mean, there's obviously a concern over resources. Um, You know, the resources that the Israelis need primarily uh, are different than that in Ukraine. They primarily need missiles for their Iron Dome air defense system, uh, JDAM smart bombs for their uh, F-16s, F-35s, and Apaches. The real uh, resource that that will be argued over, I think, are artillery shells, particularly the large sets, uh, because those are used in, in both theaters. Uh, we'll see what that looks like over the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, those are those are excellent questions that, that that this guy from Brook County doesn't have answers to right now, but is very curious to see what those answers will be. You so, are good. Uh, were you finished? Yes. Okay. Uh, you're in a, you're a candidate for attorney general. The judges on West Virginia's mass litigation panel ordered final approval of a recommended $141 million in attorney's fees for work on major opioid lawsuits. State Attorney General Patrick Morrissey has filed a formal objection to that. Your thoughts on this situation? Well, in light of what we were just talking about, I mean, this sometimes seems, you know, it's light, trivial compared to the life and death situation there, but... West Virginia has been in a life and death situation with with opioids over the past number of years, unfortunately. And to see uh, an amount that staggering of $140 million uh, go to 
lawyers instead of West Virginians who have been, you know, so deeply affected by this crisis and the communities that have been deeply affected and being able to also prevent this from ever happening again is, is certainly, I mean, it's an eye popping number. And I mean, most quarterbacks who win a couple of Super Bowls, they'll make 140 million over, uh, you know, just a one year deal. But that seems to be the case here. And that's extremely frustrating. Senator Welt, thank you so much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Uh, just thank you very much for having me on and enjoy getting able to being able to, to discuss the topic and anytime you guys want to have me on to, to do so I'm more than happy to always good to talk with you all appreciate it sir thanks ron have a great day thank you senator ryan weld at uh, nine o'clock